We've all heard about globalization. Many supporters champion the increasing international activity of corporations. They say globalization is a necessary and preferred source of economic growth. That globalization is a high performance engine delivering prosperity to all corners of the earth. Consumers have more choice. The planet is open for business. And the results are win win. Not everyone is convinced. And they are challenging the conventional wisdom. These critics say that corporate globalization, globalization from above, has hurt many more people than it's helped. They say corporations are making the rules to suit corporate interests. That big business is demanding governments put profits before people. These critics advocate globalization for people, globalization from the bottom up. In November of 1997, frontline activists, organizers, and policy analysts from around the world passed a declaration calling for a new citizen's politics to challenge corporate rule through research, education, and action. The Council of Canadians, the Polaris Institute, and the International Forum on Globalization, co-sponsored an historic global teach-in. The teach-in took place in Toronto, Canada, attended by almost 2,000 people. Leading activists and educators from around the world gathered to share their insights and strategies to challenge corporate rule. Okay, well, when we talk about challenging corporate rule, is it rhetoric, is it hyperbole? No, it's real. Most of our governments and big business, they are saying a resounding yes to globalization, speed up integration as you downsize government, give corporations more global freedoms and rights through NAFTA and the WTO and the MAI, make countries globally competitive by cutting wages, by slashing government, this is a vision of globalization from above, run by corporations for corporations. Globalization has led to tremendous inequalities and has depressed the living standards and the rights of poor people across the world, including in the North, including in Canada. It's not just economics, but they're trying to define really a corporate civilization in which everything, including our culture, and including our, our, our most intimate lives is taken over by their values. Their values of deregulation, of competition, of privatizing all of the services we have fought for and earned, of making the state irrelevant. It is in this world economy where at least two thirds are hurt, left out, or marginalized where countless others are battered by this global financial casino, where democracy is under assault. It is in this world where there is a growing citizen backlash against globalization and corporate rule. Beginning to name, to target, to unmask, and to confront the corporate powers that are driving the political agenda in this country and elsewhere. And we are finding each other across race and class and gender and age and region and country to say we have had enough, we won't back down. decided in Toronto to target Bay and King Street, which is the heart of the uh, Canadian Financial District, and uh, we decided to stage our rally of protest there to let the corporate community know that we're fully aware of the fact that uh, there's been a massive shift 
of wealth in this country over the last 20 years from everyday tax paying citizens to the corporate sector and that students are no longer going to tolerate it. Having a viable, healthy post-secondary education sector is, is a choice. It's a political choice and it needs to be done um, by those who have the courage to stand up and say, no, education is a right. It's a right of citizenship. It's not a commodity to be bought and sold. It's not something that you have to, you know, prove by the amount of money in your bank account. Our power lies out there on the street, out there in civil society, where we can bring people together and say, no, we want a fair society. A lot of people would like to think that we chose the CIBC consciously, but in the end, the CIBC was chosen because they were the only idiots brave enough to leave their door open. For me, it was, it was an amazing action. Uh, you know, when you, when you think of the amount of controversy it raised in Canada, uh, and it was very, very significant in, in the sense that it indicated in very loud, loud terms that the student movement had taken its gaze squarely off Queen's Park. It was still going to look at Queen's Park, but it was also going to look at the puppeteers behind the puppets. We're not just talking about, you know, having rallies, raising our consciousness, getting our uh, ideas out in the open. We're talking about taking action taking direct action on the corporate community uh, and in many cases forcing them to lose money and and when we do that when we actually take an action a strategic action that 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 shuts something down uh, we actually affect the income of corporations and if anything uh, gets corporations attention it's that and I've seen international corporations up close real close who do these corporations belong to? Well, they certainly don't belong to their workers. I've heard them threaten workers with taking away their jobs unless they made major concessions and rollbacks in wages and benefits. They don't belong to their suppliers. They don't belong to the communities where they're situated. I've seen them close facilities and throw workers in the economic scrap heap as they played workers off against each other in various cities and also in countries around the world. With free trade, corporations bid down wages and working conditions to the lowest common denominator, so we are witnessing the growth of bad jobs everywhere with no benefits, part-time, temporary, contingent. We're not in the age of exploitation anymore. Exploitation today is a kind of a privilege. We're in a world of exclusion. These corporations are producing eight times more than they were in 1980, but they're doing it with the same number of workers that they had in 1980. They decided that if you have a higher rate of unemployment, you will have a lower rate of inflation, and that's good for the stock market. And the people who own the stock market, who control the stock market, are in power today. So they engineer a higher rate of unemployment in order to reduce inflation. And that's why we don't have jobs. And then they blame the people in the third world for stealing away the jobs of Canadians and the Americans. They can throw their workers out on the street and the stock markets immediately react with joy and their prices, their stock prices go up. That is the proof that they don't belong to anyone but those who have invested capital in them. They belong to their shareholders. End of story. Punto e basta. Ladies and gentlemen, consumers and fellow shareholders in Canada, Inc., I'd like to welcome you to this emergency shareholders meeting. This meeting was called by petition from several shareholders who are concerned that the board of directors are not taking the welfare of all Canadians um, of all shareholders into account in their decisions about the future of this great public company and its business. Whereas the multilateral agreement on investment poses a serious threat to Canadian jobs, our environment, our culture, our social programs and our sovereignty, therefore be it resolved that the Government of Canada withdraw from the negotiations of the multilateral agreement on investment. I'm not fighting for the status quo, but I am fighting for change. 
what I'd like to see is young people who are working on the issues who have organized campaigns against corporations, who have organized campaigns on campuses to get um, corporate executives off their board of governors, um, grade 7 and 8 students who are concerned about Nike and organizing boycotts, uh, writing letters, bring all of those young people together so they can share their experiences. Young people are really, really astute and know that corporations are trying to pull the wool over them and they're not sitting back and letting it happen. They're acting on it. I encounter a lot of anger and a lot of frustration, um, but a lot of hope. A lot of young people are, are acting on that anger and taking that anger and being constructive with it and building it into fighting back. We're not sitting back, we're taking risks and we're being really in your face. And I think that there are a lot of activists who have been around for a number of years who are, who are really energized by that to see the, the new energy. I think the work we do is in your face because we're confronted by it and we're, we're attacked on all sides. Thank you. Yeah, we're angry and we've, we've got a lot of reason to be angry and we're not sitting back. We're going to take it standing up and we're going to fight back. We're really persistent and we're not going away and we're going to continue to fight until we win. Corporate rule has created a group of winners in every country who are reaping the, the rewards of the global assembly lines and the global shopping malls and global finance. But at the same time, there are far greater numbers who are marginalized, hurt, or left out. We must refuse to play the role that transnational corporations have designed for us. We must refuse to be global customers for global products. We cannot be a global citizen and a global customer. Who keeps these corporations alive? Is it only the investors? Is it only the shareholders? Is it only the people working in those corporations? No, it is more than that. The people who consume the products of these corporations are also stakeholders. We should be boycotting Nike, not just because Nike uses slave labor and child labor for making its shoes. We should boycott Nike because no rational society should pay $195 for a pair of running shoes. Corporate behavior depends on those who keep them alive, those who buy their products, and they, those are the people who should have the power, the ultimate power, to change corporate behavior. We must refuse the lifeblood of transnational corporations, and that is the growth monster. We must starve transnational corporations into submission by refusing to internalize the desires they create through advertising. Nike, Nike, have some guts. Don't just do it, do it just. Nike, Nike, have some guts. Don't just do it, do it just. Nike is targeting youth, and so. When, when, a, when a kid, when a student writes a letter or something, or when a student writes a letter to the CEO or whoever of Nike, they actually are listening to that. You know, they care about what you think about them. Because of this whole thing, they're selling an image, they're not just selling a shoe. So it does have an impact. What we have been doing is, uh, you know, demanding Nike to take responsibility for the conditions under which their products are made. Treating their workers with respect, uh, giving their workers uh, a living wage, giving the workers the right to organize, and giving the workers better working conditions. Let's get clear on the rules. The country with the lowest bid gets the jobs. Why we targeted Nike in particular is because Nike is the leader in the industry. And if you if you hit the leader, you know, we're hoping that that'll have an impact on, you know, on these other companies. She's just a troublemaker, probably a communist. It was a wonderful skit. We were having a, an auction. Unlimited overtime from China. A, a mock auction where uh, I was a worker, uh, representing a worker in the middle, and then there was countries around me. The countries were going, you know, come and invest in our country. Come here, give us the jobs. We want the work. And so, you know, some, a country like Vietnam would go, you know, we'll work for you for two bucks a day. And then, and then it would go down, and then China would be like, no, 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 we'll work for you for, you know, buck sixty a day. One meal a day. We want the right to organize. 
Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Decent working conditions. Workers have been put in jail for saying that. It was really ad hoc. Uh, there was a, I think we had one meeting beforehand. We never rehearsed it. Uh, we just said, let's do something, you know, with stilt walkers and, and a shoe. And we started with that, and, and somebody just quickly wrote up a, a little script. And we met about five minutes before the event and all huddled around and figured out who was going to do what. And, and that was it. But the sandwich board was, like, right in my face. So <laughs> I did something about it. I guess I was making people aware of the, the hidden aspect of uh, whenever they go into McDonald's thinking they'll just get something fast, cheap and cheerful, satisfy that, that hunger they have. Sure, they can do that, but you know, you fly now, but you pay later. <laughs> Doing it exactly the same uh, shape of letters and the same colors, exactly the same, it was brilliant. It's such a in one word, you could, I, it, it summed up everything I was thinking about, well, junk food in general, but especially McDonald's. Think of it this way, like you, you can go to McDonald's and order almost anything on the menu and you wouldn't require teeth to eat it. It's all sort of, you could gum it to death, you know, it's, it's very highly processed. We're not all brainwashed. Um, there is hope that we can stand up against or just be aware of and be conscious of the tactics, the techniques, the um, half-truths, the deception that's out there, um, all geared to trying to take money from our pockets. I would like to just communicate to you that if you are feeling the pinch, you can understand the suffocation and the strangulation people, not only in, our, in Asia, but Africa, Latin America, who are being having no rights to survive and to exist as healthily as they would like to what they must be going through. 80 countries have living standards to today lower than 20 years ago. It is the forced liberalization of those countries under the theory of win-win free trade. You know, win-win. You will find it from most of your lecturers in the universities and most of the textbooks. That's because they have not visited those countries in the developing world where we come from. The 1995 World Health Report had included a new international classification of disease for the first time. It was Z59.5, and those of you who are familiar with health, for, with that would know it stood for extreme poverty. A World Health Report is recognizing the fact that extreme poverty is increasing worldwide. We are having cholera epidemics. And in my, when I was studying in medical college, I was taught people who wear ties don't get cholera. So moral of the story is not that we should go around wearing ties, but it's basically, basically an, an analysis, a class analysis. With the entire concept of healthcare today is being so systematically changed. We, we have internalized very deeply that it is a commodity to be bought and sold, and if I have the purchasing power, I can buy the best health care. And if I do not, I can go to hell. The United Nations has come forward with data on what has happened to the countries and people of the world in the last 20 years. And they have found that in 1960, the richest 20% of people in the world had incomes 30 times more than the bottom 20%. But by 1995, the top 20% had incomes 60 times more than the bottom 30%. You might say that inequality doubled in that period. The result is the obscenity of the world's 447 billionaires, which by the way is up from 358 just a year earlier. This handful of 447 billionaires controlling more wealth than the collective income of the bottom half of humanity. The freedom and the power of those companies to have, in technical jargon of today, to have market access. Market access is a very nice and gentlemanly way of saying 
I want to enter your country and your market, and you have no right to stop me. We are not going to allow our environment to be destroyed because of the greed of transnational corporations or because of the excesses of the way people live elsewhere. The elite of the world, fearing that resources are running out, are plotting so that the bottom 30 to 40 percent of the world's population will be deprived of their basic rights. We want our environment to be maintained, and we want to know if at all the oil should be taken, how many is being taken, and for what purpose, and so that some will remain for our children to come. It will not depend on what the West wants. It will depend on what we can be able to give away. Lubicons, as I said, I think they've experienced corporate rule on their territories for at least the last 20 years. They were left pretty much alone until the 1970s when they discovered oil and gas in the territory. And suddenly the Lubicons became an issue. In uh, 1988, a company called Daishawa bought the rights to clear cut almost the entire Lubicon unceded traditional territories. And that for the Lubicons represented the last straw. It was, it was not just that their land and their economy was ripped apart by oil companies and that they had no land rights settlement, but that now the very forest which they based their lives upon was going to be torn out from under them. We uh, organized a boycott starting in 1991 of Daishawa products, which were primarily paper bags. Um, and that boycott successfully stopped them from logging in 1991, 92, 93, 94, 95, and to this day. Over the course of the boycott, around 50 companies stopped buying from Daishawa, uh, and that successfully stopped Daishawa from logging. The lawsuit against the, the Friends of Lubacan was um, launched not just because they felt they had some kind of legal principle to defend, but as a, as a harassment technique and as a way of stripping away the power of individuals and groups to challenge a corporation. First, the judgment said that the Lubicon situation was tragic, desperate, and intolerable, and was exactly the kind of situation that people should be speaking out about. Secondly, of course, it said that our boycott was, uh, in a word, stunning. Well, that was how they put it. Um, and secondly, or lastly, it said that uh, the boycott was not only legal, but as an example of exactly how a boycott should be conducted in a democratic society. If government has gotten out of the business of regulating these people, there, there's no, they don't even touch them anymore, if they ever did, for that matter. Um, so who is going to regulate them? We kind of stepped into that void and said, government not only is not regulating them, they're helping them, giving them corporate welfare, doing everything they can to help them destroy Lubacan territories. So who's going to stop them? And we found that the power of the average person was the only way we could stop them. Social change isn't just a matter of a polite uh, exchange of ideas with the government or with the companies, a, a dialogue and a nice sort of process. It's actually a down and dirty, you know, slugfest with these people. It's nothing nice about it. You have to uh, be persistent and not expect things to cha change overnight. You have to be uh, willing to put in a lot of hours in meetings, writing letters, phone calls, talking to people on the street, uh, get, pulling together events. I mean, whatever it is, um, there's uh, so many hours of work that go into that that sometimes it seems like you're knocking your head against a brick wall uh, and that you're just spending all your time doing things that are really not that exciting. But um, when you look at it, you step back and look at it in the long-term perspective, um, you can see changes being made and you can see that that work pays off. That I know international corporations have an enormous amount of power and we have to keep attacking them but we also have to keep attacking their mouthpieces who go into political office. Those politicians are bowing and scraping to the companies. They are interfering in the free market on behalf of the companies. And those politicians, we must not allow them to get away with that. 
So anytime you hear Kretian, all these people saying, well, we have to trade with China, it doesn't matter about human rights, we have to trade with Saharto, it doesn't matter about human rights, because we, by dealing with them, just by osmosis, import to them the basic decency of Canadians and our democratic <laughs> feel-good stuff. But just, be, just rubbing against us makes them better. Uh-uh. Rubbing against them makes us worse. It makes us less democratic every time. I'm sorry. I got that. We are asking fundamental political questions. Who really is in charge? Is it democratically elected governments, or is it really transnational corporations who are unelected and unaccountable? Here's a quote from the CEO of Louisiana Pacific. The government of Manitoba gave this company one million cubic meters of wood a year in cutting rights, including a provincial park, before they figured out if there was any wood there to meet that requirement. Their former, the former CEO of U.S.-based Louisiana Pacific, Harry Merlo, said, and I think this was slow, <laughs> just before they took him away and medicated him, he said, quote, we need everything that's out there. We log to infinity because we need to. It's ours. It's out there, and we need it all now. <laughs> That's a quote. If you want these corporations to belong to someone but their shareholders, if you want to change the name of that game, then there are certain things that have got to be made against the law. For instance, having the freedom to go off at a moment's notice and leave a community bleeding and wounded. The East Coast cod fishery should be a lesson to us all. The ecosystem was, was decimated. It's not just the codfish that are gone. There's virtually nothing out there. So what, they, what, did, what happened to our fishery in a nutshell? Fisheries Products International and National Sea Products were given millions and millions of dollars of federal subsidies to build the most efficient killing machines the oceans have ever seen. They can suck up fish off the ocean floor 24 hours a day, 12 months a year. They have radar, they have sonar, and they have nets big enough to scoop up 2747 airplanes with doors that are weigh a ton and a half a door dragging along the ocean floor. And they wondered where all the fish went. We had failed to understand that when we kept talking to governments, we were talking to ears that had become deaf or been bought. We were talking to governments who had relinquished their responsibility to their citizens and to their natural heritage and were re-emerging as the proxy or the pimps for private capital all over the world. I was at a forum, an NGO forum, with the Swiss finance minister, and he said the same thing. He said, you know, we in Switzerland are facing a national catastrophe. And that cat catastrophe is globalization. Because the Swiss companies don't respect Switzerland anymore. They are going to England, they are going to Malaysia, they're going to China. They are merging and they are retrenching people and we politicians are getting the blame. You see, we politicians have lost power to the market. Politics has no, no longer any meaning because the market has taken over. Now, how can these politicians say they can't do anything about it when they were the ones who did something about it to bring about this situation? People who run for office must be accountable to the people who elect them, and they can't cop out by saying some international corporation is dictating to them. If they can't do the job, step aside, let some of us in there that will take on the corporations. And we have the right to protest. We're not terrorists. We're peaceful protesters. APEC to us symbolize a lot of things that are wrong with the world right now. Um, the total. Uh, ignoring of human rights abuses of the environment, of issues related to women, of issues related to poverty. We're opposed to this idea of looking at the world as uh, one big commodity and looking at human beings as capital, not at human beings. The problem isn't just with Nike or just with Shell. It's with the, the worldview, the, the motivation that, um, behind what these companies do. Don't you want to know who stole your paycheck? Check in the wall to the guys with APEC. We try to be creative, incorporate street theater, tell people that to be an activist, to be active, to be engaged, to oppose corporate rule uh, doesn't mean you're not cool. It actually means you can be really cool and be really creative and be really funny and use humor. <laughs> Within Canada, um, certainly there's a network of activists that are staying in touch through a variety of means, uh, through the internet, but also by meeting face to face, which is the most important thing. Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, coordinating actions, learning from each other's actions. I have a vision of a different world, a world that's totally different, a world uh, 
a liberated world, a world where we don't exploit people, where we don't exploit the environment. Be really critical. Ask those critical questions and you begin to see people suddenly not giving you all the answers. Well, look beyond that. Look beyond the bill of goods that you're being sold. We are in a new age. We are in a period where we're breaking off from everything that has gone before. And these are very difficult periods, and it's awfully hard to see where you're going. I think that we're a little bit like the people in the 18th century who were trying to figure out a way to build democracy at the national level. They were fighting against the power of monarchy or aristocracy, and we're fighting a kind of oligarchy of the elites, the transnational elites, who run these corporations. They were fighting against arbitrary laws, against no taxation without representation, and we are trying to fight against a new kind of economic hegemony. We're fighting against a spurious legitimacy of corporations who are doing everything they can to make the rules to suit their needs. You have to understand that these adversaries will stop at nothing, and we've got to pick up the task of our ancestors and build democracy at an entirely new level. And this is extremely difficult. We've got to do it at the international level, and we're groping because we don't see exactly how to do this yet. We are working for a new global citizenship that we must pull up the rights and standards of workers in Honduras and Mexico and Indonesia if we are to advance our communities here. It is a politics that has to unite across different lines, different sectors, that includes the workers, the civil society, the women, the environmentalists, and across nations, whether they are in Asia, whether they are poor, or whether they are in Canada, that are fighting for a better world. All of us in this struggle share the values of democracy and inclusiveness. All of us are attempting to forge new paths that are equitable, sustainable, and participatory. We believe that we are part of a broad-based social movement. The labor movement belongs with the NGO community and the women's movement, the anti-poverty movement, and the gay and lesbian movement. We're part of a broad social movement, both domestically and we must build it internationally. There's lots of gifted and determined young people and I'm not sure that in my lifetime I'll see the, the advent of international democracy, but I know that the, the seeds are there and I know that the people who can make those seeds prosper are there. I've seen them. Your ultimate dream must be to dismantle all of these institutions and set up one in which the corporations come to us and ask for rights, not us going to them and asking for rights. Because for the first time in history, it's quite a literal statement to say that the struggle of each is for all. Because what the corporations are trying to do is to put us all in competition with each other. They're trying to make a Hobbesian world where everyone is against everyone and in competition with everyone. And that is the ethic that we've got to beat. So it is the struggle of all for all and not all against all. This isn't a metaphor. This is literally true. We've proven that you can actually do something about globalization. You can do something about corporate rule and you can do something to change the situation that we're facing. Uh, that's a pretty powerful lesson in and of itself and uh, I stick by it wholeheartedly. It's, uh, they'll tell you every day that you're powerless, but you're not.